Welcome to Lecture 24, Vector Spaces, Abstracting Linear Algebra and the Geometry that Goes with It. So we're going to introduce now the concept of an abstract vector space. This is more of a mathematical concept, but it shows you that there are many different things that we can actually think of as vectors that we wouldn't have perhaps naively thought of as vectors, and we'll go through some examples of that in the last slide of this lecture. So the first thing we need to do is define exactly what is a vector space. So it's going to be a collection of objects, v, little v, that are elements of the vector space, big V, that have the following addition and multiplication properties. And we call each of those elements vectors. If u and v are in the vector space, then u plus v is also in the vector space. If I form the sum u plus v, it equals v plus u. So the summation is commutative. If I look at the sum u plus v plus w, it equals u plus v plus w. That's an associative property. It says that it doesn't matter what order I add them together. I'll always get to the same final place when I add different vectors together. There also must be a zero vector such that that zero vector added to every other vector just gives back the vector. So 0 plus v is equal to v for every vector that is in the vector space. That's called the additive identity. For every v, there's a vector minus v, such that v plus minus v is equal to 0. That's the existence of an additive inverse. If a is a scalar and v is an element of the vector space, then a times v is an element of the vector space. a times u plus v is equal to au plus av. That's a distributive property. A plus B times V is equal to AV plus BV. That's another distributive property. AB times V is equal to A times B times V. That's an associative property. And finally, 1 times V is equal to V. There's a multiplicative identity. So if these scalars, the A's and the B's that we were using, are always real, then we call it a real vector space. If the scalars can be complex, then we call this a complex vector space. And as an example, ordinary vectors in Rn will form a real vector space that has n dimensions to it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about independence and dimensionality. Let's start off with a set of vectors v1 to vn. They're going to be dependent if there exist scalars alpha 1 to alpha n. Now remember those will either be real or they'll be complex, such that alpha 1 times v1 plus alpha 2 times v2 all the way up to alpha n plus vn is equal to 0, and not every scalar is equal to 0. So, of course, trivially, if every alpha is equal to 0, that sum is going to equal 0. The vectors will be dependent if there is some non-trivial solution to this, so some non-zero solution for the alphas, such that that summation is equal to zero. And an example, if I have the three vectors 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 0, 1, 0, they're going to be dependent because 1 times 1, 0, 0 minus 1 times 1, 1, 0 plus 1 times 0, 1, 0 is equal to zero. And you can easily see that those vectors because the sum of the first plus the second is equal to the third. They're clearly dependent upon one another. Now a set of vectors v1 to vn is set to span the vector space v if every vector in v can be written as alpha 1 times v1 plus alpha 2 times v2 all the way up to alpha n times vn. And we would call this set v1 to vn a basis for the vector space v. If these sp spanning vectors are dependent, then we can use the fact that they are dependent to reduce and get rid of one of the vectors. And then we can ask, is the new set, which now has n minus 1 vectors, is that dependent? And if the answer is yes, I can reduce it again. And I can keep doing that until I get to the point where the set of spanning vectors are going to be independent. And when the number of, uh, when the set of spanning vectors are independent, that forms a basis that is the kind of basis that we like to use for a vector space. In particular, if we count the number of independent spanning vectors, 
that will give us the dimension of the vector space. And in addition, because the spanning vectors are independent, the coefficients alpha 1 to alpha n for any given v, any given vector v, they're called the coordinates of the vector space in the given basis, and they're going to be unique. There's only one of them. All right, let's move on to the scalar product. Let v be a complex vector space. And then we're going to define a complex valued scalar product, which is going to satisfy the following properties. Of course, this will also hold for a real vector space. I just don't have to worry about any complex conjugates. The scalar product between u and v is equal to the scalar product between v and u, and then taking a complex conjugate of that. If I take u with a scalar product with the sum of v plus w, that's equal to the scalar product of u with v plus the scalar product of u with w. If I multiply a vector u by a before I take the scalar product, that's the same as multiplying a times the scalar product. A vector scalar product with itself is always greater than or equal to zero. And if a vector in a scalar product with itself is equal to zero, then u must be equal to zero. Then that vector must be the zero vector. So there's only one vector whose scalar product with itself is equal to zero, and that's the zero vector. All right, let's look at an example of a scalar product. If we had n tuples of complex numbers, then u dot v equal to u1 v1 star plus u2 v2 star plus u3 v3 star all the way out to un vn star can be shown to satisfy all the properties of the scalar product. I need to put in that complex conjugate to guarantee the first property, but also to guarantee the fourth property, because then I'll be taking the sum of the absolute value squareds of the different terms in the basis vector u. Or, I'm sorry, in the vector u. The next thing we're going to talk about is the norm of a vector. You can sort of think of this as the length of a vector. The norm of a vector satisfies the following properties. Well, first, here's the definition. The norm is equal to the square root of the inner product of the vector with itself, or the scalar product of the vector with itself. Because of the property of the scalar product, this norm is greater than or equal to 0. And if the norm is equal to 0, that implies u is equal to 0. This just follows from the properties of the scalar product. If we have a number that we multiply by u, now it ends up being the absolute value of that number times the norm of u because we have the square root of the square of that number coming out. And so it becomes the absolute value of that number. And that's the norm or modulus of the number if it's a complex number. And then we have the two interesting inequalities. The first one is called the Cauchy inequality, which says that the absolute value of the scalar product between u and v is less than or equal to the norm of u times the norm of v. And the second one says that it's called the triangle inequality. It says that the norm of u plus v is greater than or equal to the norm of u plus the norm of v. So let's prove the Cauchy inequality. We can assume u does not equal 0 and v does not equal 0 and the scalar product between u and v is also not equal to 0 because the inequality will obviously hold in those cases. If u dot v is 0, it says 0 is less than or equal to something that might not be 0. If u is equal to 0 or v is equal to 0, both sides are equal to 0 and so we get the equality. So if those are not 0, then we can define lambda to be the absolute value of the scalar product of u with v divided by the scalar product of u with v. Now, this object is going to be less than or equal to 1. Um, I think another way, a perhaps a better way of saying it is that the norm, or the absolute value of lambda, because lambda can be a complex number, unless we're looking at a real vector space, um, the 
modulus or the norm of lambda is going to be equal to 1. Okay, that's really the important property that we're going to be using. So now let's look at the following thing. We're going to look at the norm of lambda times u divided by the norm of lambda, um, norm of u, minus v divided by the norm of v. So I can kind of think of u divided by the norm of u as a unit vector. v divided by the norm of v as a unit vector. And because the absolute value of lambda is equal to 1, that also is going to end up being something that is looking like a uh, unit vector, or less than or equal to 1. Okay, so when I evaluate and expand that norm, I'm going to write it as lambda u over norm of u minus v over norm of v, the inner product or scalar product of that object with itself. And then I'll use the definition of the norm and these other properties, and I'll find that 0 is less than or equal to the norm of lambda squared, I'm sorry, the modulus of lambda squared times the norm of u squared divided by the norm of u squared minus lambda times the scalar product of u with v divided by the norm of u and the norm of v minus lambda star times it would be the scalar product of v dot u but I'm going to write it as u dot v with a complex conjugate and that's going to be also divided by the norm of u and the norm of v and then we're going to get plus the norm of v squared divided by the norm of v squared so the first term becomes 1 because the norm of lambda is equal to 1, or the modulus of lambda is equal to 1. The last term is equal to 1. So when I add those two together, I get 2. When I look at the other two terms, I use the definition now of lambda. Lambda is the absolute value of the scalar product of u dot v divided by u dot v. So that changes the numerator of the first term to absolute value of u dot v. And it changes the second term to absolute value of u dot v complex conjugate. But the absolute value is a real number. And so I get minus 2 absolute value of u dot v divided by the norm of u times the norm of v. Now we're almost there. I bring the u dot v divided by norm of u norm of v to the left hand side. And I get 1 is that sign is incorrect here it should be one is greater than or equal to scalar product of u dot v divided by norm of u times norm of v so i'm sorry there's a typo there that should be one is greater than or equal to that and then when i multiply by the norm of u and the norm of v on both sides we get the scalar product of u dot v is less than or equal to the norm of u times the norm of v which is called the cauchy inequality now you've already seen this and you know this what this says is that the Scalar product between two vectors is less than or equal to the length, the product of the length of the two vectors. And this is an identity that you already know. It's called the Cauchy inequality. And here, just using the abstract properties of the norm and the scalar product, we can explicitly prove it here. All right, on to the triangle inequality. So the triangle inequality says that, uh, says the following. Uh, it's written for you up there. Let's prove that inequality. So u plus v, v quantity squared, let's just, the norm of that, it's just equal to the scalar product of u dot plus v dot u dot plus v. Let's expand that out. The first term is going to be scalar product of u with u. That's norm of u squared. The next one will be a scalar product of u dot v. And then the next one is a scalar product of v dot u. And then that's plus v, the scalar product of v dot v, but that's norm of v squared. And then if I look at the fact that u dot v plus v dot u, v dot u is the complex conjugate of u dot v. If I have a number plus its complex conjugate, that's equal to twice the real part of that number. And so it's equal to norm of u squared plus twice the real part of the scalar product of u dot v plus v squared. Now, of course, the real part is less than or equal to the modulus. And so this is going to be less than or equal to u squared plus 2u dot v plus v squared. And we're now going to use the Cauchy inequality, which will allow us to replace u dot v, the absolute value of u dot v, by the norm of u times the norm of v. And we're going to find that the sum of u plus v must be l less than that, okay, because I'm adding something that is greater. 
on the right hand side. But now I can factorize the right hand side as the norm of u plus the norm of v squared. And now I can take the square root of the two. And so I'll get u plus v is less than or equal to the norm of u plus the norm of v, and that is the triangle inequality. And I can see both on this page and on the previous page, if you look at the formula I wrote on the top, that has the triangle inequality in the opposite direction, which of course would be very difficult to prove because it's not correct. The correct one, which is the one that you know, is that I take the sum of two vectors. The length of the sum of two vectors is less than or equal to the sum of the lengths of each of the vectors. That's called the triangle inequality. And there's a geometric picture of this you probably saw in high school where you show how you can construct a triangle only if the sum of the two sides is bigger than the length of the third side. And that's where the name triangle inequality comes from. All right, let's look at some examples. Our first non-trivial example is going to be v sub n. It's going to be the set of polynomials of degree less than n with complex coefficients. This is a complex vector space. If I look at one vector, u, which will be u1 plus u2x plus u3x squared, all the way out to un x to the n minus 1. And a second vector, v, which is v1 plus v2x plus v3x squared, all the way out to vn times x to the n minus 1, where all of those coefficients, the ui's and the vi's, are complex numbers. Then I take the scalar product u dot v to be u1 v1 star plus u2 v2 star plus u3 v3 star all the way out to un vn star. And if you remember back to what we did when we looked at the scalar product for a complex vector space of complex n-tuples, we use the exact same scalar product. And there's an exact identity between these two. We actually say that this vector space is isomorphic to the set of n-tuples of complex numbers. And here we're using basis vectors 1, x, x squared, all the way out to x to the n minus 1. Okay, good. That was a simple example. Let's look at a more complicated example. Uh, this is going to be the set of real valued continuous functions on the interval from 0 to 1. We're going to take as the scalar product f scalar product with g to be the integral from 0 to 1 f of x g of x dx. Now if I think of x as the index, so think about a Riemann sum for this integral. I would have a delta x, I would have an f of xi, a g of xi, and I would multiply them together and add them together. Now if you think of that as sort of a big vector, f of x1, f of x2, f of x3, all the way out to f of xn, as some really big vector, you can clearly see that this integral is the generalization of what is a traditional scalar product. And so this actually satisfies all of the properties of a scalar product. There's no complex conjugate here because these are real functions. And one of the questions that you can ask is what would the basis be? Okay. Before we ask that, let's uh, just point out say one of the properties of the scalar product. So if I wanted to look at showing f dot f is greater than or equal to zero, well f dot f is an integral from zero to one dx of f squared of x. Now f squared of x is a set of non-negative numbers and so when I sum a set of non-negative numbers I have to get a number that's greater than or equal to zero. A slightly more difficult question and in fact one that you really have to look at carefully in terms of limits and so forth which is why this function is continuous is that the property is that if the scalar product of f dot f is equal to zero, then f is equal to zero. Now we know if we took a uh, function and we just changed its value at a number of finite points, or even an infinite number of points, uh, we can do it. If it's just at isolated points and we change it at any value that we want, then the integral doesn't change. But of course the function has changed. And that's why we need to have the uh, notion that these functions are continuous. So the only continuous function whose integral of its square is equal to zero is the function that is identically equal to zero. And so we get that part of the scalar product to hold as well. All right, now let's talk about the basis. Uh, it turns out that sine 2 pi x, sine 4 pi x, sine 6 pi x, sine n pi x with n actually going out to infinity forms an independent set of basis vectors and to see that these are independent let's assume that they're not independent let's assume that they're dependent which means there's a set of numbers c2 c4 
out to cn such that the summation is equal to zero. Now, if that if we can show that the only solution to this is when all the c's are zero, then we can show that the set is independent. And the way that we do that is we pick one of those sine two m pi x terms, and we multiply that whole summation by that term, and then we integrate it between zero and one. Any case where the m doesn't equal the index in that sum, so if I looked at sine 4 pi x times sine 2 pi x, let's assume that I made m equal to 2, uh, that integral between 0 and 1 you can show is equal to 0. And it's only the case where they're the same. So if I have m equals 2, it would be the sine 4 pi x times sine 4 pi x, which is sine squared 4 pi x. The integral of that, obviously not 0. But only the one term has an integral that is not 0, which means because the integral of the right-hand side being 0, if I multiply it by sine m pi x, I still get 0. And if I integrate it, I still get 0. I learned that c4 is equal to 0. And then by multiplying by sine 2 pi x and sine 6 pi x and all the way up to sine 2n pi x, each one of those times then doing the integral, I can show that in turn, every C2m is equal to 0. And so if every C2m is equal to 0 is the only way that I can get this expression to equal 0, then the set is independent. And so this is the way that you can prove that the set sine 2 pi x, sine 4 pi x, etc. actually forms a basis for the set of real-valued continuous functions on the interval between 0 and 1. Now whether or not it's spans the space, that is a more complicated question, and that is one that was addressed by people like Fourier, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the class, but we're not yet ready to delve into the topic of Fourier series, but the topic of Fourier series really deals with the issue of whether or not that set is a spanning set. Does it include, can I expand every real valued continuous function as a series of sines or a series of cosines or what have you depending upon what the particular arrangement is of the function and what its symmetry is okay uh, that's it we're done